let's get that going. Right. How are you? How's the ride? Um, I don't know about you, but it's, um, feels like we're on a bit of a roller coaster here, doesn't it? Right. We're kind of up and down around left. Uh, Kit thinks it's uh, Kit from IMAX thinks it's like a tumble dryer. Um, I think it's like a roller coaster. I know, but done about you, but my kind of, my energy and my kind of um, mood switches. Sometime I'm in states of terror. Sometime I'm in a state of grief as I've lost friends and I've lost family. Um, here in Barcelona, we've been very badly affected. Sometimes I'm angry. I'm angry at government. I'm angry at people. Sometimes I've been locked in for 50, whatever, how many days it is. I feel very bored and just dying to get out. Um, and sometimes I'm really optimistic when I see some of the amazing things that are happening around the world. So we're going to be kind of taking a journey through some of that today. But I'm going to be asking and throwing out some questions. I'm going to be saying to you, is this the end of the events industry as we know it? I want to provoke you to kind of think about that. Or, or is this something much better, the start of something much better? So is this a magic push to reset the world? But what I am going to throw out to you is that this is a proposition. This is a time for change and that we should be really using this moment to really think about our future. And I'm going to be throwing out, which I thought was original when I said to, when I wrote this, something called the big pivot um, and about how we pivot from the old linear way of working to a new regenerative circular way, which is much more influenced and where we learn much more from nature. So really about rethinking, redesigning, and regenerating our future. And I mentioned the nature there. Nature is very important to IMEX. It's the theme for this year, Nature Works. It's something that myself, uh, Janet Spears did, and Amanda uh, Cecil has been working on. Um, and we're going to start to share a little bit about our research agenda and where we've been going with that. So that's a little bit about the, uh, the journey. So as I said, uh, and as I mentioned, I live in Barcelona. Um, I know many of you from my time here in Barcelona. I'm obviously English, but I did my Brexit, I don't know, 30 years ago. Um, I know many of you from MCI. I was with MCI for a very long time, for 14 years. I had a fantastic time there. One of the greatest companies in this industry. Um, and then I left to, to explore something new and set up my own consultancy. And I took a project with me called the Global Destination Sustainability Index, which is was and still is a collaboration with MCI, ICA, IMEX, European Cities Marketing, and now my company, Google. And so we work with cities all around the world. And so this is kind of my reason why I'm here, because I, I work and focus on, on trying to create better, more regenerative and flourishing destinations around the world. And so I work with kind of 60, 60 destinations, really. Okay, that's the past, right? So now let's kind of think about where we are today. Welcome to the new normal, right? I think this photo kind of says it. This is this the kind of new normal of what events are going to look like when we sit and we get people together, when we meet again. Will events ever be the same? We know that flight access is going to be different. There won't be so many flights initially. They'll be more expensive, the tickets. Hotels will be different. Funding for events and funding for DMOs will be different. Client demand will change. We've got organizations such as Microsoft putting most of their events off physical events to, to June next year. And we're going to see more things like that as people postpone. We see a big shift going, obviously, online. We see people starting to rethink food service. I live in Barcelona, the home of, you know, you know the home of tapas. Will we be having tapas? Will we be able to share food into the future? Interaction will change. Visas and health issues and health legislation and tests will be all different. And obviously, there's a whole question around plastics and the use of that. So many, many things are changing. Um, the US Army created a, a word in, I think it was in, in, in the first Gulf War in 1992, called VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. I think VUCA is an exact word for where we are now what a perfect acronym yeah it is certainly uncertain and volatile and we have no clue to tell you the truth really where things are going what we do know is that there will be new rules around meeting around going out um and they will go up and they will go down as the situation changes as vaccines become 
available, as more medicine and research comes more available, things will change. So there's a whole uncertain world there. There's also, and that's kind of top down, but there's also this bottom up change of behavior like this, you know, we're getting used to working online. We're used to having 558 of us at the moment um, together. And so as we get used to this and used to buying more things online, new habits and behaviors will stick. And is that that will change the normal. At the same time, it's, um, you know, we can't say really, I don't think we can say we did not see this coming. For the last 10 years, the World Economic Forum has been telling us that infectious diseases is a serious risk. Uh, on average, a new infectious disease emerges into humans every four months. 75% right? of these diseases come from animal. Yet we haven't changed the way we look after animals. So is coronavirus a message from nature? Because well-managed healthy ecosystems manage viruses much better. And at the moment, we're not managing our ecosystems in a way that's healthy. So we're not diluting, we call the dilution effect, the viruses. And so basically we're living outside of nature's limits. Many of you have seen that, especially those of you in Australia. Um, any of you in the kind of cold parts of the earth have seen the temperatures change. 23 degrees in January in the Antarctic. That's not living within nature's limits and we're creating various effects. Great quote I saw this week from Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England. He said, we can't self-isolate ourselves from climate change. So I think they go very, very much together and I'm sure many of you do. So I don't think we can underestimate that. One thing we did underestimate was the interconnectedness of life, our economy, the resilience of tourism, the resilience of the events industry. This is a map about climate change and look, infectious diseases is out on one side. Well, that's changed a lot really. We really have a different view of how interconnectedness. And here's just one example. You know, one of those charts of that map was about pollution. We've now seen that cities that are more polluted generally have a higher rate of deaths because perhaps because the lungs can't handle um, the virus so well, or perhaps because the virus is sticking to pollution particles. A lot of things that aren't so clear yet. But all of this kind of makes you stop and think. It kind of makes you stop and think, right? And what I sit and think about is what are some of the strengths of our industry? We've seen some amazing stories of friendship, collaboration, um, partnership. Here's just a picture from Ephema. It kind of touches your heart when you see whole convention centers all around the world, Chicago, DC, Spain area have been turned into hospitals. But at the same time as it's shown some good parts of our industry, it's, it's shown that we're not quite as resilient as we thought we are. There's a great phrase from Warren Buffett that says, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. I think many of our businesses have been swinging naked. We're just so fine on a, on a resilience level, making just enough money um, to keep us going. And now that it's collapsed, we're, we're not in a good situation. There's also, when we kind of look back to the new normal, and a lot of people doing that romantically, I'm not sure it was so romantic. There was a lot of things that didn't work. You know, zero hour contracts, people not being paid enough or fairly. Um, we were flying far too much, weren't we? Right? One year I took bloody two, 120 flights and I'm an environmentalist. How can I justify that for the work I do? The old normal didn't work for the planet and it didn't work for a lot of people. You know, the 1% of, of the population has the money, the 99% who doesn't. The good news is that the world was changing. We recently, in, in January, we finished a, a research project to look at the, and to conduct a barometer of sustainability. And we saw that 90% of event professionals consider sustainability important or extremely important. 79% of, of those stated that their focus on sustainability had changed in 2019. We really saw a tipping point. It was, God, it was one of those days I kind of really woke up and felt, my God, we're achieving something. 97% of event organizers 
were implementing sustainability practices in their events or 97 right we really had tips obviously not all of those were perfect and some people thought it was perfect and it wasn't but i think most of us knew we were on a journey um and we knew we had to get better so the question for me now this data was from january what would happen if i'd repeat the data now has our has covid changed our focus will we go back to the to the old and throwing away things or will we stick to the new and the future if uh, a big poll just done by maury and the bbc came out and said 71 percent of people believe that climate change is as serious a threat as covid19 i think it's potentially a bigger threat even though it sounds harsh and doesn't feel right to say that right now but globally 65 percent think that climate change needs to be integrated into the economic recovery plans and that's kind of part of the big pivot and, and what I want to come back to. Okay, so everything is going on. And then I saw this quote, times are urgent, let us slow down. And I thought that was a really interesting quote right now. Times are urgent, let us slow down. I think we really need to stop and look at what's happening around us and think what is COVID-19 teaching us? I live in Barcelona. I drive down, and whether I'm in Barcelona or on this image or in Delhi, the sky is clear. It's beautiful. Uh, I can breathe. There's no cars. Um, for my couple of hours a day, I'm allowed to do exercise. People are exercising. People are happy. There's no cars. There's a, uh, signs of friendship and companionship that you don't normally see. And for me, it's kind of a paradox, a paradox of like, you know, the economy is going to hell, yet we're kind of better in many many ways so there is this big paradox and the kind of paradox i think goes further is that could covid19 actually save more lives than it's killed today when i look 282,000 people have died a lot that's horrible about 5 million deaths each year are created from air pollution 1.25 million deaths are created from road accidents so i think that's a really interesting proposal where we're at so ladies and gentlemen I think it's time for us to rethink. I think it's time for us to rethink our why. Let's go back to uh, Simon Sinek's uh, kind of circle. It's, what is our why? What is our purpose in the meetings and events industry? There's a great line uh, James uh, from the iceberg said to me this week, last week, he says, are we travel agents or change agents? Why are we coming together? Why are we bringing people together? What is the value that we're creating in society? Because I think we can reevaluate that sometime. We are an amazing industry that creates jobs, but we can get better at creating jobs. We can create more knowledge and create more investment. We can advance social purpose. And we can take the UN Sustainable Development Goals and all 17 of those areas and really think about every, every and each one of the events that we do and each of our businesses can really start to advance the world. Because we know that up to now, to, to a certain degree, it's been very regenerative at our past. It hasn't been very sustainable. The last few years we've made moves towards sustainability and we all said that was great and green economy and everything like that. But for those of us who work in this and for, for most of you, you realize that what we're doing is not enough. Sustainable as we understand it is not gonna work. So what we have to do is regenerate. We have to go to the next level. We have to be fixing the problem. And really, that's kind of where our focus needs to be going, about regenerating, restoring nature and the people, the 99%, not the 1%. So I think our time is about um, looking at our future, creating a new normal, a regenerative normal, where people, places, businesses are flourishing and thriving. That's everyone, all parts of our ecosystem. OK, now is not the time to go back to the old and the familiar. And as we introduce new regis legislation that allows us to to meet, um, we don't want to be rushing back to plastic. And uh, but that's the solution. That's the solution being asked by the governments to a certain degree. So we have to challenge it. And one, but we also have to redesign our systems to make re regenerative systems that are healthy. 
So we have to use it as a catalyst, uh, events as a catalyst to catalyze the circular economy, to catalyze a safe economy, to catalyze an inclusive and equitable economy, to catalyze the knowledge economy, to catalyze a resilient economy that can stand some of the chaos that we're going to have to deal with with climate change. And unfortunately, it's not just about mitigating results, it's about getting ready and prepared. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, now is the time for this big pivot, where we really stop to rethink, we really start to work together and collaborate like we've not done before. I'm talking about extreme collaboration between all sectors. And through that collaboration, we design a, a better future. And through that future, we start to restore and regenerate the people, the communities, and the businesses right now that need doing. So there's a great quote that comes from Milton Friedman, the kind of grandfather of, of, of capitalism, really. And he says, only in a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. Only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we better start creating some lie ideas and make them lie around because we're going to need them into the future. So the kind of question I think is, you know, can we afford to go back to business as usual? Because I'm not sure we can really afford long term to go back to the old ways of doing it. I think we have to go to the next step and really, really go through to a different way of working. Uh, let's, so I'm going to go to the second part of the big big pivot. The first part, you know, about that rethinking, redesigning, regeneration, how we integrate it into our business models. Okay, that's what's got to happen. It's got to become core business. The second part is really about learning from nature uh, and having a kind of restorative or regenerative business strategy. Okay, so it's the next part of this. And nature is very interesting because nature spent 3.6 billion years on research and development. Okay, she's been doing this a long time. She is a living, learning, evolving, innovating library of knowledge and solutions. She is the kind of the master of systems change. She is the master of living um, in, a, in a flourishing and thriving environment. And nature reacts to change by, not by resisting it as, as we do, but by adapting, okay? She adapts. She balances herself. She supports each other. Look at these mushrooms. The mushrooms are growing on the tree. There's a symbiotic relationship there. And when the tree dies, it creates um, a kind of compost that will facilitate further mushroom growth. So how do we have that kind of support system in the meetings and events industry? What would that look like? Nature is resilient. Like, let's just take an example. When there's a fire that comes on, we use that fire to rekindle new growth. Right now, our industry, or the house of the meetings and events industry, has been torched. It's burnt down to the ground. There is hardly any meetings around the world, hardly any tourism around the world. But we will rebuild it. That I'm sure about. So let's look at nature and think, how do we re re reboot something that is even better? Okay. And let's not forget, we are nature. We're part of this. We're not separated. And I've seen so much. It's only problems because people think we're separate from nature. Oh, nature likes to do this. No, 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 we are nature. And so for that reason, uh, IMX, leadership of Kit and, and Karina, they decided to really focus on this this year and actually for the next two years. So we've been working at this. And our, our, our focus is called Nature Works. It's kind of a player word. And so nature we think has kind of three aspects that are really interesting in the meetings and events industry because nature inspires a circular economy. We feel that we have to go and drive towards a circular economy in the events industry. Nature designs. So they think nature teaches us and she teaches us how to do better events. And the last thing, nature connects. You know, when you get people in, in nature, your hormone levels change, your, um, your wellness changes, you become more creative uh, and you can become happier. And all of that makes for a better meeting. All of that makes for a ways to, to look at a challenge and fix it. 
And sometimes, a bit like sustainability, we kind of look nature on the outside. I think it's time for us to really bring nature back into the events industry and think about how we can change things. So that's kind of our research and uh, agenda. We've only kind of started this. I don't have so much to, um, to share, but I'm going to kind of focus on a little bit about nature designs and the biomimicry and a little bit about nature spies, the circular economy. So circular economy in the, in the events industry is really in its infancy. We've seen some kind of um, innovation happening, but really not much. Kind of most people are kind of focused on, on just recycling. They think that's circular. A, a circular or a recycling economy is very different to a circular economy. In the research we just did, we saw that 43% of, of you guys are the respondents and there's over 1,500 people replied, don't have a circular economy strategy. Only 3.4% feel that they have an advanced strategy. So obviously we've got a long way to go. Okay, so we've got a long way to go. We're all familiar with the old way of doing it. The old way of doing it was taking, making, using it, and disposing of it. Think of the, in the old days, the typical stand, right? We'd build an exhibition stand at IMAX. We'd build it out of wood. Okay, so we take trees, we'd bail it out of wood, we'd use it once and then we'd throw it away. And you go out the back of um, Frankfurt and you'd see all this wood there. In the last few years, we're getting much better. More and more trade show hosts are using uh, modular systems. There's still a lot of build, there's still a lot of waste, but we're on a journey of circularity. But we need to get better. Why do we need to get better? Is because today, only about 10% of all of the resources we use around the world are recycled back into the economy, are reused back. So, so just think about it, right? There's only one planet. We're already using three planets worth of resources. So the raw materials aren't there for us to go forward with. So we have a big issue. It's a business issue. It's not an environmental issue. This is a business issue. Um, and you've already seen um, people in the IT industry, for example, getting very worried about getting rare metals and things like that. Then it becomes a social issue as well, but we won't go to that. So we have to look at nature and look at the way, uh, you know, trees grow and then break down and then compost and then that recovers and restores things so nature teaches us about that so we need a model where we are reusing more we're repairing more we're remaking or refurbishing more and then only as a final effort do we recycle okay so when we look at that we have to get much better at separating biological uh, materials or resources from technical resources this diagram is called the butterfly diagram okay so Biologically, that's food um, and products such as that, or materials made from biological materials, I would, okay? They can be composted and rebuilt back into the system. On the other side, the plastics, the glass, the metals need a different approach. They're much more expensive and difficult to recycle. So hence, there's more of a business focus on, on reusing and repairing those. I think in the work that we've done, and this is again with, with Janet and Amanda, we're looking at this and we think there's a better approach to event planning, resourcing, procurement and production that maximizes the functioning of our ecosystem. And remember, we're part of this ecosystem, ecosystem with our clients. Okay. It's also about how we look after our planet and all the people within it. And so that's the kind of the, this, this, this focus of the circular economy. So let me give you an example. This is from my friend Gary in South Africa. Uh, and he was working on, the, uh, on a great exhibition for the wine industry in Cape Town. So Dirk, I'm sure you know these guys out there. And so in the old ways, they would build these stands with wood, um, lots of labor, lots of mess, lots of dust and thrown it away. Now they built the whole stand system and everything in that trade show from something called Chanita. Uh, which is a uh, which is made from recycled post-consumer waste. So this is all cardboard, but it's not like the old days where we had kind of really fluffy, nasty cardboard systems. Now the quality and the price point has really got to a level that it is a business um, viable solution. Okay. So not only did they replace the toxic MDF chipboard, which is you know, so it's toxic, uh, it's um, 
and all the plastic that was involved. But in the way they did this, right, it's quicker to build. It's cleaner, okay? Um, it's less transportation because it's lighter. Um, afterwards, you can flat pack it, which means it's easier to repackage and store to be reused again. And it's so sturdy now, you can reuse this for you know, five to 10 times. So all of those are cost benefits as well as environmental benefits. And the last element, if you think of the kind of people, planet, profit approach or regenerative approach, is that the, the, the stands that weren't used were given to schools and then they could use those in the local community as desks in the schools. They turned them into other furniture also. So there's many, many kind of benefits from that approach. So that's a really good circular regenerative approach. Okay. And it goes even further than that. So that's one example. Um, the second example is circular, but it's more about biomimicry uh, and, and biophilia. So it's really about learning from nature. So that's the next thing. The next block is nature designs. So I'm going to pick an example from, from Western hotels. Um, and they've done some fantastic work in stepping back and looking at their, uh, how they design their hotels. And they've taken a great system to look at kind of 12 aspects of nature and what you can learn from it. And I'm going to pick three here. So here they're looking at nature as a space, nature's analogs, which is his materials, and nature in the space, so nature of the space and nature in the space. So let's look at nature of the space. So here it's about what's, um, what's nature offer us? It offers us kind of interesting refuges, sacred spaces, elevated spaces. So you imagine here the photos of a cave as a refuge somewhere safe. Or imagine you're on a cliff looking out and you've got an expanse. So nature offers us different perspectives, okay? Different vantage points. The second block they're looking at is nature's analogs. This is the materials, the subjects as patterns from the wood or from the leaves. And the third one is about nature in the space. And that's like, how do we bring nature into a hotel space? Right. What about the light? So look at the great picture of a cave and the light coming through. It's not like the light we'd have in a normal office, which is on or off. There's shadows. There's kind of, you know, different patterns to that light. So how can we mimic what nature creates? And that can be the sound or everything through the space. So here's an old uh, hotel room of Westin. Uh, Pretty ugly, right? Pretty kind of nasty. So they went through this nature-based design process that the architecture team and the design team have been working on, and they came up with a new approach. So a lot more use of, of woods, you can see a lot more shells and subjects on the wall, hidden lighting, change lighting. Look at the, the entrance, and you can see kind of they've created something that makes the, the patterns of light come into the room. So it's not just harsh lighting. They're using the shelves. Look at the wall in the, uh, in the bathroom there. It's kind of mimicking the sand textures of a beach. Um, and this is just one aspect. There's lots of different aspects here of what they're doing. And that's to kind of give us an idea that we can use nature to stimulate things. And so for the next 18 months, we're going to be researching a lot more of this. Um, we want to come up with some kind of design-based thinking work as well. So if you've got any uh, great projects, please reach out to us. We're looking for data and we're looking for people who want to experiment with us. So I'm working with two marvellous academics here, so Janet and Amanda, um, and uh, please reach out to us. So someone touched on regenerative um, leadership earlier. So regenerative leadership is a really interesting space and it's very much a new area of leadership studies. And it's really about thinking, looking at nature as, as um, and taking away from nature aspects that we can incorporate into our management styles and teaching. So it's a lot about really learning at living systems and understanding how ecosystems manage health um, uh, and issues like that. So, um, that's a key part of it. So I think really within regenerative leadership right now, it's about 
individual and corporate purpose. So we've got 17 SDG goals. What is where do you personally sit within those 17 goals? What are you going to do to regenerate and restore society? And then how does that fit within the organization you work for? Um, how can you become that agent of change in your organization? And maybe you can't. And so then maybe you want to think about, is that organization right, right for you? Because some places aren't going to be right for us in the future. And I think there's some big decisions that we need to place and make about really where we fit. Um, and then lastly, how do we increase our own individual and collective capacity to become agents of regeneration? And that's about how we support people. So I don't have time to go into that today. I could do a whole speech about that. And perhaps we will. We'll be doing coming up with a kind of more information and a paper about that. Our next papers are going to be around the circular economy. Um, so I noticed I've got Daniel up there, my top right hand corner. Daniel, I'm going to feature a story about the great work that you've done around food in Thailand um, and really doing some amazing work there. So uh, so that's another Marriott property by chance. Um, but there's some great work. So please send us stories if you've got those. Okay, so to kind of wrap up, um, I love this phrase. Are we change agents or travel agents? And I don't think that's knocking anyone who works in travel because that's really important. But really, for events right now, there is a need to accelerate change, and we have that capability. So I kind of want to want to kind of you to think about something in a few years' time, 20, 30 years' time. When you've got grandkids and you're sitting there and you're telling them a story and you tell them a story of the COVID virus and how that wreaked havoc on mankind and how mankind came back and triumphed, a classic hero's tale. So think about that and how we've learned from COVID and how we've restored society and how we've created a best, better place to live. And have a think about what your role is and what your role was in that journey. Because that'd be a great story to tell. Uh, you stepped up in these tough times. So use that to then come up and really start to look at the big pivot, as I say. How do you really integrate regenerative thinking, circular thinking into that? And I think it's a loop. And it's a loop of many things about leadership, people, processes, technology, collaboration. It's about rethinking and redesigning our products, our business models. Uh, it's about getting rid of some things. It's about creating new things. It's about having a different relationship with waste and about starting to use that as a resource. It's about focusing on regenerative resources and not using the, 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 the toxic products. It's about designing them out of our systems. It's about really thinking about how we regenerate people and nature through food. It's about how we regenerate communities and, and tackle problems. And lastly, it's a kind of telling a different story of numbers. The numbers we use today to tell success aren't right anymore. In the future, we need different numbers to tell a story of success in the work that we do. So different indicators. So that's the journey, people. Right now, I invite you to be courageous. These are tough times. Um, a lot of people will tell you it's not the moment to look at sustainability, we have economic challenges and they need to be focused on. And many of you don't have businesses and you're struggling. So I invite you all to be bold, to be brave, to be kind and to be flexible. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You can uh, find me at Guy Bigwood at gds-index.com. That's the website of the work we do with destinations. And as the front page of the National Geographic of this week says, and it's very clever. It's got two sides. There's a story about how we lost the planet. And if you flip the cover over, this is how we saved the, the world. I invite you to, to, to get your own copy. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. It's really a pleasure to see you. I wish we could give each other a big hug right now. <laughs>